Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. In this video, we are looking at reverb in music. Now, I will start by saying this is an often very misunderstood or misused part of making music. Uh, people often see reverb as being, uh, you know, a, a little bit of spice to taste, um, that you could use it or not use it or whatever. And of course, anything in music is up to you. I mean, art is a, is, is a personal thing. But all music is illusion. And if we don't show people exactly what they feel they need to make sense of what we're showing them, it simply breaks. Now that break could, in theory, create a whole new style. Just as impressionists suddenly started painting things differently and some people were like, and other people were like, ooh, that's, that's, that's really interesting. But to simply do it in a way that doesn't fit the laws of nature and go, well, I'm just inventing something new is probably unwise unless you understand what you're doing. Uh, so let's, let's start broadly and then we will dig right in a lot deeper than you think you want to go. The idea being to cover a lot of things that are not normally covered in this subject. Let's start with a little demo piece. <laughs> knows what that is, we'll call it trip down because, well, it is broken, but that's not the point. We're not here to judge my uh, random music making skills uh, when I've spent about 15 minutes doing it, but to go, okay, we've got this sound. Now, this is a sort of mix I hear a lot, and it seems like everything's there, and there's some wide, and but there's no depth or joy in this. What happens when we do this? Flat, pretty pointless. Lively, extra groove, and depth. Not width, but depth. Depth is way more important than width. Everyone these days focuses on width, probably because it's easy. You can go, oh, well, I've panned it, therefore it's wide, man, and therefore it's great. It's like, yeah, there, there needs to be depth. So we've added a lot more depth. Sounds have actually found place for themselves inside the mix and actually now stand out that didn't before. Listen for the hand drums, the bongo-y thing, no reverb. They're there, but they're kind of invisible at the same time. Now they're quite vibrant. This is reverb. This is what we actually want to have and need to have. And as I said before, everything in music is illusion. Let's look at that in photo terms because it's easier to explain in many cases. What happens is that people will just make a recording, you know, it's like hold their phone to something. And then we listen to it, they go, but that's, that's wrong. That's not what I was, that's not what I was hearing. This tells us the really key fact that recordings are illusion. They don't match what we actually hear. Therefore, the recording and mix engineer has to know how to point people to things. Here is an example. Um, I didn't want to choose a happy snap uh, because people probably wouldn't get it as easily. Here's an example of a photo that we could say is really poorly framed. It would appear that James Rass is a fairly famous photo, and I am taking it out of context initially. It would appear that James Rass is actually trying to show us a photograph of a bison and doing a rather bad job of it. What many aspiring mix recorders or engineers would do is, oh, well, okay, we've got this problem. And there would be the equivalent of James Rass going, oh, well, I want to photograph that bison. I better go out and mow all the grass. And, oh, yeah, there's some mountains and some sky. I better whitewash those, then take the photograph. That's the wall padding and, and trying to make weird things. The thing is, there, we need to help people focus on what we want them to focus on. Now, James has taken this photo that seems like it's wrong. Exactly how it came to be, I do not know. But he gives us a cue. The name of the photo is called Poorly Hidden. So he actually turns the fact that 
this animal is, is largely obscured into the subject of the story that he's telling us, which once we take that in, oh, this bison is trying to hide in grass that's only like a third of its height, becomes the story that he's telling us. So by framing, by telling us what we are looking at, by giving us the right information, by giving us the right cues, we now understand, oh, isn't there humour in the fact that this bison's like this big and the grass is this big and how did it feel like it could hide? It's the, um, I can't see you, therefore you can't see me. Anyone who has a cat knows all about that. This is a really important concept that a lot of people don't get, that recorded music is illusion and we need to tell people what to think and feel and simply putting wall padding in and going, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll have no room, it doesn't work. Let's look at this another way. Here we have a pair of pictures. On the left-hand side, we have a guitar in a room and nothing's happening. It's boring as well, something that's really boring, completely bland. On the right-hand side, someone's come in and gone krang, and we have a strum and our orange amplifier has spread orange all the way through that room. Now, the less than fully understanding audio engineer will go, oh, but that's wrong. Yeah. No. When we hear that guitar, we are hearing not the guitar, but we're hearing the room. And that is as much part of that guitar as anything else. We can tell things about the guitar, where it is, what's going on, by the room around it. If we remove room, that guitar now makes no sense to us as a listener, as in it has no place in reality. And that is very disconcerting for us. It's the equivalent of, if you watch that movie, uh, Gravity, Sandra Bullock, uh, Mr. Goodlooking himself, uh, floating in space, completely disconnected from everything. There's not much of anything they can do to solve any problem. And that's, well, problematic and incredibly disconcerting. The room is part of the guitar sound. To say that it's not is, as I say, incredibly disconcerting and will break reality and the listener will go, I can't make sense of this, this is really uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable like waking up at, uh, at three o'clock in the morning because something feels off and there's Ozzy Osbourne lying in your bed. He's crept through the window whilst you were sleeping. He's lying in your bed looking at you. That's like creepy. We must have a room that our sound occurs in. Here's a third way of looking at this. Here's a stage play. It's on stage and it has a scene. Reverb is the scene. If we took that guitar sound minus any space, remember it seems wrong. While there are theatre companies that uh, cut corners by making their plays without any scene, it's really hard on the audiences, really hard. And they're not popular shows. If you look for right or for wrong, film has replaced theatre, and increasingly CGI has been more and more, well, I think, overused. This tells us that people want to be shown everything, the context. Is it necessarily right for them? No, but it shows us what humans want and therefore to some extent need. So we see here a play and we're given context for whatever is happening in here. I stripped this off the internet, so who knows what that's about? It's not the point. Reverb is part of the scene, like the, the buildings and the lighting here. It gives context to these people who are strutting around the stage, quoting Nevermore at each other. Super, super important. If you don't really get that inside yourself, sorry, someone going ping, then you will struggle to actually use reverb in a useful way. You will be one of those people that just goes, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll sprinkle some pepper on top of this because maybe it'll make it good. That's not intelligent use of pepper, especially if it's not a dish that really benefits from pepper. You've got to use what you're doing very, very intelligently. Also, I will run through, as I commonly do, the negatives first, because what happens is people take the, here, this is, this is the wise advice, and then they plow straight into the holes, not realizing that this is a thing that you really need to be aware of. So let's deal with the reverb in a mix. A, don't overdo it. 
Unless it's deliberate, don't overdo it. It's easy to overdo reverb, and that then makes it sound bad. The equivalent of that is to don't underdo it because you don't like reverb. That's really overdoing it. Don't assume it's good because it's easy. And that's a reasonably modern one. Don't assume that because putting reverb in is easy to do, that it's therefore been done well. That's a fundamental problem, especially in Dorville, where reverbs are now everywhere and you can put like 300 in your uh, in your project because your door will let you and hopefully still keep running don't use presets this is vital if you go to a good production cats frozen whatever they've built fresh sets for that they haven't just wandered out the back and gone uh, well, that was the one from Wizard of Oz. Nobody will really notice that it's got Wizard of Oz written on the castle. If you went to that production, if it was for your five-year-olds, yeah, maybe. But if it's a serious production that is expecting itself to be taken seriously, you'd go, no. Nah. And you would walk out disappointed, if not just walk out. Bearing in mind it's incredibly easy for people to walk out now because they've just clicked on your thing and they can click away. They've got a million other things. Then... Don't use presets. Presets are really designed just to show the kind of breadth of what a machine is capable of. They are not designed to say, here, use this. People think that's what they're there for, but that's what they were, they were never there for that. Don't use presets. People will go, oh, but you use them as starting point, man. It's like, okay, that's just not knowing how to do something and just randomly applying things. Uh, it's like flipping through and going, oh, well, are we in Carnegie Hall or uh, are we in um, Madison Square Gardens or are we in Harry Potter's cupboard bedroom? That means they're not really thinking, where is this taking place? Remember with that play, there's a scene. The scene is very deliberately built because somebody sit back and go, where's this supposed to happen? What's this story about? What do we need to portray here? And simply adding random bits of scene or, or stage furniture is not going to make that production seem stunning to the viewer. Don't use presets and don't impress your ego. You are not here to please yourself. You might go, oh, but my music's all about me, man. And if you're the only person that's going to listen to it, you're probably right. But the moment you plan to put that in front of other people and have them want to listen to it, it's actually about them. It's not about you. It's about them. It becomes about you when they go, wow. Mr. Dire Straits, that Romeo and Juliet song is so evocative, it's so great, and when you do the bit with that, and you go, then I just, I just melt. That's when it becomes about your ego. Really important. Everyone's going to want to cover reverb shape, so we will. Basically, you, on um, the algorithms, you will see things that say room. Room tends to be a relatively square type shape, meaning that all the reflections are relatively the same lengths as each other. You saw in the um, guitar picture that we've got a pretty cubular sort of room, but even here we've got a different amount of colour based on the different walls and how close they are to the orange amplifier as to how orange those walls become. But a room will be relatively even. The sound will come back pretty evenly all round. Hall means that rather than the room being square, it's now rectangular, as in one dimension of that room is significantly longer than the other. So you'll get a combination of short and even, but also long. And that gives you a hall-like sound. Chambers are rare now on, on modern digital uh, reverb units, but a chamber quite literally was a room put aside in a studio. They'd put a loudspeaker into the room, some kind of furniture, bits and pieces to change how that room reflected, and then a microphone or two somewhere in that room to pick up the sound. That's a chamber. There are virtual chambers out there. Some of them are just, um, are just bunny ears to stick on, use them if they amuse you, uh, but there are actual sort of virtual chambers where you can move things around. I've never really enjoyed using them, but I'm a little unusual in the way that I work with reverbs. You will also see plates and springs. They are quite literally applying sound to metal 
to make it vibrate and then tapping that sound off the other end, turning back into audio signal and mixing it with the uh, sound. Springs tend to be very sparse and often have got a boingy sort of a, a thing to them. Listen to 50s, 60s uh, rock and roll and country records and you will, you will hear spring, particularly on the guitars, but you're also tending to hear early echoes, which are tape-based or sometimes valve-based. Plates are just quite literally a flat piece and they tend to give incredibly dense and incredibly even reverb spaces. This is why commonly people say use plates for vocals because they have this really nice thickening effect, but there is no rule about what you use where. The only rule to be what you use where in terms of reverb styles or shapes is quite simply, what's the space that we want people to feel this is happening in? If we want them to feel like it's happening in Harry Potter's bedroom cupboard, then we want to go real small and real tight. If we want them to feel like it's happening in a basketball court, then we want to go big and loose and flubby and flappy. If we want them to feel like it's happening in outer space, then while we might be tempted to say, well, there's no reverb in outer space, people won't feel that at all. It won't make sense to them. It'll just feel creepily intimate, more so than Harry Potter's uh, bedroom. Then you need to use something incredibly wide and diffuse and possibly really thick. Probably the complete opposite of what would be happening in space is what people are going to feel like, oh, sounds really spacey, man. So there's no rule about what shape you use for anything. The only rule that you work on is how do I tell my story? Once you tell your story right, people will follow you. Then we've got the when and how do I reverb? And then we'll get into the really ultra practical. Well, my advice very, very strongly is make your reverb space first. Otherwise, it's a little like sending your play people out onto stage to do the play without knowing where the bits of scenery are. All that's going to mean is that uh, when Romeo goes to quoth nevermore at Juliet, he's likely to trip over a tree. That's not a win. What you want is to work on your reverb becoming the spindle. As in, this is the space in which we're working, and all my decisions are relative to this space. Because a reverb defines, remember, the space in which the thing is happening. If you think, oh, well, I'll just mix everything so it sounds perfect, and then just apply a little bit of space to it, it'll never make sense. Your space won't belong to the piece. The piece won't belong to the space. You've got this extra strange instrument. It's just confusing. So create your scene. My advice very strongly is start with what you're going to mix your track around, as in the spindle. For me, a lot of times where it's a vocal song, then the vocals are the most important part of that. Then I'll start with my vocals, I'll build the reverb space. Where do I want this song to happen? Where does it seem like it's happening? Is it happening in a jazz club? Is it a really intimate jazz club? Is it happening in a bigger jazz club? Is it happening in a pub? I spent quite some time setting up a, uh, a song. It was a protest song, and I set that up to appear as though it's in a wooden pub. And every element is set as in this very specific sort of place, and when the client heard it, it's like, wow, this is important because we need to tell the story in which people can put themselves in that very scene. So choose what's going to be your spindle. If it's a vocal song, I recommend vocals. Set your reverb space there. Build it from scratch. It will take a while to learn to build from scratch. You'll set your spindle sound and the reverb space that it's happening in. Apply that to all the elements of your mix. We then need to look at how things are done. There are two main pathways. There is send and insert. Very strongly, remember, seeing we are working towards this scene, then we want one reverb space. That could be built out of lots of reverbs, but for now, just go with the idea of one. We have one reverb, and that becomes our shared room. If everyone's not in that room, then they're in random different places. And unless that's really what you're trying to say to people, that we've got Mary here and Vivian here, and they're in two completely different rooms having phone conversations to each other, you might get away with it. 
but it's probably better that they appear to be in the same place. Because whilst they're having that conversation, they are actually emotionally in the same place as each other. So don't go separating out lots of different reverbs. It's a really rookie error and good way to make your piece feel confusing to the listener. One reverb, put it on a send. That's this over here. You see we've got these sends which come back on the return. Your reverb that sits in the middle, you make sure that the mix is to 100% wet so that the dry signal comes through the mixer here to the masters and the wet signal comes back through the return. But only the wet signal. If you're sending back dry signal as well, then you're messing up your balances. Very simple. That's where you start always and every time. If you start in other ways, you will have difficulties because you'll set yourself up with all these different environments, often a different environment for each sound going, well, that makes this sound perfect. But then when you put them together, you've got 13 different rooms. It's really mind boggling to try to comprehend. It's almost as though each of these actors in this window here was in a different scene. You'd be like, this doesn't make sense. It's like the latest Matrix movie. Uh, so really, one reverb, send. There are times where you will use an insert. An insert is, well, we can't show them here because they're not from send, but on a lot of door mixing desks, you will have them sort of in here, and then you add another thing, and that sound goes through that thing before it gets sent off to your send reverb. Now, really important that your send reverb picks up whatever you've done as an insert. So if we plugged our singer into a special reverb for them, which is incredibly unwise and I don't do it, but let's say it's a synth and a pad and we want more to make that seem like it's big, then synth, reverb, desk, send. I will set my send amount to what I feel is right for that synth pad, and then I will work on building up the reverb space for that synth. Otherwise, what will commonly happen and fail is that somebody will build the world's biggest reverb for that as though it's everything. Then they go, oh, well, then I push it into the, into the room reverb, it sounds too swimmy, so they pull back the room reverb, and then that synth pad is not connected to the rest of the record. Pull back your insert so that it sparks up. A little bit here, a little bit there, all feeding everything that comes later. The other one that we have is the stereo versus mono thing. Some people really don't understand how this happens and even go so far as to say that mono send or mono input into reverbs is a failing of the past. They didn't have the technology to do it properly. No. Simply because how many guitars are in this room? One. How many people are listening in this room? One. How many ears does that person have? Two. You start to see. So the room is fed with one which propagates out by each of these walls bouncing back sound, that creates stereo. We had a mono guitar and a stereo ambience coming off the walls. And that is pretty even. You might go, especially with my picture there where we've got more color on one side than the other, you might go, oh, but the reverb will, will be unbalanced if that guitar is on one side of the room. Not as much as you think the perception is, is, quite, is quite capable of managing that. Doesn't mean that you can't pan your reverbs a little bit, but be very careful how much you do it, or you're gonna create something that feels really unnatural. It'll impress you because you're impressing yourself, but that's feeding your ego. When the listener hears it, they're just gonna go, this mix feels disconnected. They don't know how or why it feels disconnected, they just go, this song feels weird and walk away. You don't want that. Remember, it's too easy for people to click away these days. Classic send reverbs will be hitting the reverb in mono, as in saying we're taking everything from this room. We're taking all the sound like it's mono and then create this stereo bloom from that. That makes perfect sense and is an incredibly wise way to go. 
when using an insert, you might consider using a what's called true stereo. So separate stereo left and right in, separate stereo left and right out. And if you've got a hard pan sound, which is not always wise, then you might have no reverb on the other side. But because that's feeding into the send reverb, then that will get pulled to mono and you will get your unique reverb on your synth on one side and your room appearing across here. And that gives us the illusion here of that room with more orange on one wall than another. There is no rule about what you do other than that because you're creating the illusion of Lionel Richie in front of me here singing about his ballerina girl dancing on the ceiling. Oh, how things changed. Well, I guess she did do some dancing. Anyway, moving on. Uh, the reality is it's an illusion. There is no Lionel Richie here. I'm given enough cues to feel like, oh, there's Lionel. There's a bass player, there's a bongo person, there's a synth person, there's a guitar person, and a flail around like an idiot person. The illusion is, and I feel that nice, and, and I believe it, because I want to. If the illusion is broken, then as I said, it just feels weird, and people will go, why is that weird? Is it because we're being shown something new and different, like the first Matrix, or is it weird because it's broken, like, well, pretty well all of them afterwards? So don't go assuming that a mono input to particularly a send reverb is some sort of technical failing. It's actually helping you do the job the way it should be done. Now we get to move to the really intriguing part of the program where I'm going to show you how reverbs get built. There are various different ways, but I'm gonna show you how they get put together. Remember we got this piece over here. <laughs> flat becomes big and vibrant. Great. You will notice that I've got the reverb send on a bus because I've got my drums, or all of these bits, sent to a bus. This is how it should be. Look what happens if we turn it off on the bus and just use the individual sends, which I see people doing. Maybe a little tricky for you to hear, but you hear that that reverb seems a little disconnected from the piece, particularly disconnected from, say, the drums, because what's happening is our rhythm section is going through some processing. There's a compressor to make it groove, and if that reverb doesn't have the groove attached to it, it actually undoes the groove and it just makes everything sound cluttered. Now where it's back where it belongs. The reverb actually emphasizes the groove of what's going on there. It has a slightly less send level, just so it doesn't become too slushy, but this is really important. Do slash don't. So we're using buses, and buses are wise, even if you're not doing any processing on them, send from bus, not from the individual channels. Sending from the individual channels will do what's called delaminating, as in the reverb is based on this sound and what the person's hearing is based on this sound, and they, they don't match anymore. Keep them together. For the moment, we will mute that and move into the rack. What we have here is an incredibly expertly played electric piano, because I am the jazz master, I am joking. We won't worry about the compressor, that's just for a little bit of punch. I'm gonna pull these out. The main reverb is out too, so now we've got a fully dry sound. We'll pull that off. This may be a little complex, but it's important to understand how it works. I'm showing you a basic reverb and how it is built. Uh, as I said before, there are various ways to do this, but this is a common and helps you to understand way. We've got our basic sound coming out of our electric piano, post compressor and effects. It's input here, it goes back to its channel for the desk. We'll, we don't need to know about that. Now, here's the signal. It's sent to a splitter. That splitter sends the original signal to a crossfader here and that becomes our dry signal. 
It's then cloned off to three delay units. This is a pretty sparse reverb, but you hear how impactful it was in that piece. I like sparse reverbs. Um, so each of these is going to add something. So for the moment, just see it as oh, it's being sent to one, and then the output of that, it's got some post-processing, which we'll get later, but essentially the output of that is sent back to the other half of our mixer. So we'll fold those up because we don't need to see them anymore. At the moment, yeah, nothing's really happening. Dry, wet, all the same. Let's punch this in. Okay, we're hearing a delay, an echo, that's not reverb. But let's look at what, what happens. Firstly, let's turn off sync. We, we, I never use sync, but let's turn it off because we want shorter sounds. But that's still just a tap, it's just a one bounce. If we increase our... We get the sense that, hmm, this is adding some space. Awfully dry and flat. Add in a little bit of this. While we can hear those taps, it's actually acting like a reverb, but it doesn't have that kind of thing to it. We can add diffusion. Diffusion's done in various different ways. It can be by making each tap come back at a slightly different time and, and other things, but notice how that gets a little mushier. So as time goes by, that's starting to sound like a reverb. That's of some value. If we shorten our time quite dramatically, now that's starting to sound like a spring, except a spring tends to have a kind of a wobble in it. That's essentially what a spring does. We've now got a kind of reverb. People paid good money for reverbs that sounded like that from about the mid 40s through till at least the late 70s. If we combine the diffusion, we're starting to improve that, but we've got this sort of sense of, especially if we, it starts to whine. So if we add a, Vibrato to it. That softens up. It gets rid of the wine and it softens up. So we've now got a surprisingly workable. Reverb. That's with one some stereo is being created with that LFO. We could also create or enhance stereo with just offsetting. So that's essentially a pair of taps that are slightly different. And the wider the, the, the difference between those two taps, then the wider that stereo is going to seem to be. That's a working reverb, but it's not what we might call super smooth. So let's add a second tap. Let's kill our first one. 100% wet. Again, let's do sort of roughly the same thing, but let's not put it in the same place as our first one. Let's make our first one shorter. So say 48, 87. A 
basically do the same things. And put the pair of them in. One, two. Hear how that becomes smoother and richer. Sounding more like what we're used to. Now if we bring in a third, let's just pull these ones out for the moment. Seven, we probably want to go a little bit longer. And yeah, that's really coming fairly smooth. getting a separate out into wide. We've got this mono sound that becomes wider. That is a reverb. That's a very, very usable reverb. How do I know? Because that's essentially what this is. Now there's a little bit more that we could, should, do to this reverb. This is our basic sound, just showing that we've got lots of delays. So that is the equivalent of, because we've actually got six taps happening here, two, four, six, that's the equivalent of a room, because we've got four walls around us, a ceiling and a floor, that's six. So we've got six surfaces bouncing back at us. They're not really interacting with each other, other than the fact that they're put together. We could change the sound level of each of these. Let's go more into it. Yeah, how that smooths as we go out. We could also reduce it. So that makes a slight sense of what's called bloom, as in the sound happens and then whoop, the reverb builds. So it's giving that sound a somewhat explosive nature. It gives a lot of emphasis to it. Wonderful on snares. Whereas if we go back to the... It sounds a lot flatter. It's not as explosive. So by using time, then and you have to learn to hear these things. If you're not hearing it straight away, um, preferably be using good studio monitors and be in a reasonable position for them. Failing that headphones, but not nasty, nasty, nasty ones. You know, not like. Um, beats or something like that because it may not help you hear this stuff now that's giving us a not as much of that explosive sense because that can become problematic now let's process the the other parts of the reverb let's look at changing the tone of each part let's just solo we can change So let's warm the first one up a little bit, just a tiny bit, and put a tiny little bit of overdrive on it. We don't want to hear this. We don't want a distorted sounding reverb. Hear how that's changed what we're hearing already. We go to our next one. You might say, oh, okay, I want that one to be I want that one to be brighter. It's very subtle, but you just hear this little sense of, of brightness come into the sound. And then the third one, well, we'll, we'll dull that one down.
we now created this nice space just with six echo taps. But we want to make them work together a little bit more. So we've got this in the path. This is just affecting the wet signal. We're going to add another echo in. But we want to turn that off. There are a couple of ways we can go about this. If we're 100% wet, we get what's called pre-delay. So in other words, there's a time between the sound and the first echoes appearing. That is a useful thing, and most reverbs will have some kind of pre-delay. You generally want to keep that relatively small. It provides, A, a sense of largeness to the room, so you can use a shorter echo of time or reverb time overall and give a bigger sense because there's this distance before we hear the first slaps but come back. Some people will say, ah, oh, well, it's great, you can put these in sync and then hear them come back in time. That's just creepy because this is not how the world works. You don't walk into a room that's working at 124 BPM. <laughs> you just don't. While it'd be possible to work out what its timing was, you don't say I'm only going to perform in halls that work at 124 BPM because that's what my song's at, because you'd have to go to a different hall for every song unless you write every single song at 124 BPM, which could be a tremendous selling feature or just stupid. So we can have that pre-delay, or we can mix. Let's go long. So that's giving a, that's giving an echo, a distinct echo in the room, and that echo is actually made of the reverb sound. So rather than using a separate echo that we send to, which then has no reverb on it, and therefore the echo sticks out as being like, that's weird and wrong. We hear this sort of ghost sense. Come back in here. We can make that. Or back here. In which case we we're not really aware of it, but what it's doing is lengthening the reverb tail. Especially if we And of course we can apply all the same kinds of processing. We would probably want that to be a little less enthusiastic. And this is more where we would decide the overall tone of our reverb. You can put left right stuff at this point but it's a little less wise you've already got stereo you can put your diffusion on everything is based upon what you want to achieve our longest reverb was 111 let's try two times So we're extending our reverb a little bit and giving it a... a kind of a shape. We're changing what's happening in our room. Cool. Then, of course, we can do any of the usual things to it. Remember, we have been EQing here, but we can do stuff like... Putting it into overdrive. Let's reduce our thing here a bit. So that's pushing us into distortion. That probably is a bit much. 
but we don't want to do this unless it's very deliberate. So watch what you use. Tubes, tapes are very nice. Just keep your outputs at about even. Hear how that changes the feel of the room? It actually makes the room feel more together. That's glued. This also has a little bit of compression in it. It's not a compressor I use normally, but in this situation, that's gonna work nicely. We can change the overall feel of our room. Don't put too much bass in. Normally you're gonna to wanna to roll some off. And you can also do things like this. which is just a resonator. I've talked about those quite a few times in other situations. That's made it quite dark now, probably more than I would be hoping for in this situation, but... but we've got a sense of that piano happening somewhere now. Doesn't feel like it's happening anywhere, even with that little bit of that dark room. Our brain can be starting to imagine something like uh, a fairly large, but probably quite empty, dark room. So, uh, you know, a, a jazz hall or something like that. It's put a sense of scene around our performer and our performance. If we pull these back a little bit, and they don't have to be the same length. Let's reduce our diffusion by quite a lot. It feels like it happens somewhere. As to what's right, well, that's down to your piece. You can't say what's right before. Now, these are the real kind of pro tips. I've shown you the obvious of how to mix, when to mix, what you should do, what you should not do, the, the holes not to fall into. But here are the real more pro tips. For the moment, we're just sending to our send reverb. We'll pretend this is our send reverb for the moment, like the one that's over here and being sent to the piece. And we've set it up and we, we like this. We should feed the reverb things that are going to spark it. One of the reasons I tend to use sparser reverbs is because I know that I want that reverb to really represent what I'm doing, not to be the sound that sounds exactly the same because it's too characterful. It sounds exactly the same no matter what I put into it, whether I put a snare drum or, or Celine D on or can Cannibal Corpse, somehow the reverb always sounds the same. That's, that's not a particularly good strategy. You might say, but that's the right reverb. Okay, but it's not the right reverb if it's not actually enhancing whatever's being fed into it. I know that Celine would rather be more Celine-y than just sounding the same as everything and everybody else, because why would we bother buying the Celine record when it sounds like everybody else? There's no point in that. So what we then do is feed that. Now this is Hertz Multiplier. This wee fellow, go, it's free. Go uh, watch the video on it. This is designed to sit like a sort of a, flanger phaser chorus version of a saturator. It's not doing any distortion, but it is that sort of very subtle lift. So if we get rid of our... What this does is add a little bit of character to that sound. It makes certain parts of it stand out. 
and other parts of it not so much. Let's say it's just solo that so you don't hear the keys clacking. Hear how when it comes in? It's hard because of the click, which is inevitable. But you hear this sense of extra character and presence. Because we are adding this little sense of a resonator or room around that unique sound. Now we don't want to overdo it. I would rather do this once I've got my reverb set up, otherwise I'll overdo this. Somewhere around there we just get this very indefinable sense of lift and uniqueness come into that sound. We've made that electric piano more electric piano-y. And that's feeding the reverb. Flattish. Got this exciting sort of character that's appeared. And the next one is the also free Hertz Delay. Again, there's a big video on it. This one's doing echo duties. We don't want a lot of it. But as we push that into our reverb, especially along with the multiplier, hear how our sound just embiggens without necessarily the feeling of it becoming reverbier. I, when making this, just kept pulling that wet back, 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 until we just get that little imperceptible rise. The, so as we see, the reverb itself is in essence a chain. The sound itself is in essence a chain that then feeds that reverb. Remember, this reverb would really be over here on the send. I'm just using this one because that's what we've been building. But that's why you hear such a big rise, because we've got lots of little things feeding that reverb. So when I first start to mix, remember I decide what's going to be the spindle I mix everything relative to. The maypole that everybody dances around and, and, in, and in the end, even though it looks like a mess, we end up with this really ordered thing if it's done anywhere near right. Uh, so your process here is to say, what's the room that I'm in? Then how do I use that room to help tell the story? I've used the multiplier and the delay here to help tell the electric piano story, not only to make it more electric piano-y, but also to help tell the story of whatever this formless ramble is. Let's just bypass that now so that we're pushing into, you see the sound changes, and back to here. these guys out. Hear how the electric piano just loses position and focus. Using this delay here, and I use these all the time, it's very rare that anything gets to my mix without some kind of delay somewhere, with the exception commonly of drums and bass, but not always. It's not uncommon for me to even use it there. It depends on where I want them to sit in the mix. But this little bit of delay here that's mixed in, even though very quiet, helps us say where that electric piano sits in relation to things. So if you listen to just this, So with that 
that little bit of delay, and I've changed that from, from, the, the, from the mix that I had before, the electric piano finds a place on the stage, in the scene. Otherwise, it just feels like it was sort of stuck on the front. It's like a post-it note stuck on the front of the fridge. It's not in the fridge, it's just on the fridge. It's not part of fridge life. If we open it, we no longer see it. So the little bit of delay helps it put it inside. And therefore, we've got a sense of separation from these instruments by ensuring that they all have a position which is feeding our send reverb. And that's how these things are done. My reverbs don't sound sparse once my pieces are finished. People comment on how clean and clear and present everything seems. And that's because it's built up of lots of layers. You can distort those layers if you want, but you've got to be careful because then it just... But that comes down to a personal taste. I will do very driven mixes, and people are often surprised as to how much saturation or drive I may have in something. But everything has found a real place and is separated out in space, rather than this kind of just smashed together glob that might be super wide, but it doesn't have any real presence. So remember, if we go back to here, let's turn off this reverb. It's, it's there and we can pretend it's good. It's got all the mix elements working for it, but it's got no spark, vibrance. got a lot more drive because it's picking up what's happening to our other instruments and the reverb is picking up this This has changed the groove, right, wrong, irrelevant. It's changed the groove, and when that reverb is coming from here, as it really has to, then when it comes in, it actually emphasizes. This sounds flat and pointless. And we get a really nice drive from everything and the reverb is enhancing that not hiding it enhancing it but that comes from the fact that this reverb was built to make this sound good built to suit the piece built to become the scene in which this action takes place applying flipping through presets going oh which preset matches it's 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 the lottery it's a crapshoot um, you might get lucky, but chances are you really won't, uh, and you'll you'll just settle on something, and it's not really playing the same game as what your piece of music is playing. In which case, it then just becomes problematic, just like where people put a an insert on every single thing, like a reverb insert on every single sound. We've got thirteen separate rooms. Everything conflicts and fights because it's like, which room are we in? And then they go, oh, well, it must be an EQ thing, man. Especially if they go online. So, oh, you need to, you need to separate your EQs. <laughs> it's not that we don't do some of that as mix engineers, but if you've broken it already, you will be going to fix the wrong thing. Whereas if you just went through and turned off all these insert reverbs, set up a send, which was built from scratch to match the scene and story of your piece, you might bring some inserts back in and make them enhance what's necessary in that instrument within that room, but you would probably have at least half of those off, if not all of them, if you were wise and used echoes rather than reverbs, then you would suddenly find, hang on, I didn't need to do most of that EQing, or I did it a lot more subtly than was otherwise needed, simply because you've overdone the EQ, which then makes things sound two kinds of weird at once. We're in separate rooms and all the sounds are being like this. And it, it doesn't pan out. This is what real mix engineers are trained and have skilled and experienced themselves in. So reverb is 
a whole other instrument. It's part of your piece. It's as much part of a Metallica record as Lars. Take Lars out, have we got Metallica? Well, you'd be like, what happened to the drums? It's an important part of it. People say funny things about Justice and the mix, but it's an uncompromising mix, and the reverb is part of that. Take the reverb out, if we just switched it out, we may not think we're listening to reverb when we listen to Justice or any of our favourite records, but if we switch it out, then suddenly... So don't mix your reverbs wrong. Don't make the mistake of thinking that reverb is just going to make your piece mushy because it just means you don't know how to handle reverb. You've got to build a space. You've got to build a scene. If you can't show people what that scene is, remember this, then people will be like, I can't get into this. I can't feel like I'm being taken somewhere special, which is the equivalent of, I guess, going and opening Netflix, putting on Lord of the Rings, uh, and you've got somebody standing there uh, wearing bunny ears and... Um, and telling you that he's a hobbit, and that he's going on this great quest, and look, this ring, um, just like the uh, uh, DiCaprio, Romeo and Juliet movie, he's waving around a pistol going, oh my sword. Okay, right, it's called a mismatch, dearie. So really, first principles, always understand what reverb is. Music is illusion, reverb is the scene that this takes place in, and it has to emphasize that scene, otherwise you've got a fight. And if you've got a fight that you didn't plan for, isn't part of the process, then don't go trying to solve it somewhere else because then you've got two problems or three problems or four problems of compression and EQ and all kinds of things, when it was probably just poorly handled reverb. Build your reverb spaces from scratch. If you don't know how, that is okay. I don't know how to make a guitar do really cool things. I can get Jake in and tell him what I want, and he'll have a couple of goes, and I'll be like, yeah, a little bit more cowboy. Like that? No, no, more cowboy. Like, yeah, that's what I want. Because he's a guitarist, and he's worked out what I mean when I want more cowboy. And it might be, yeah, get rid of the strat and put on the telly and play it this way. And it's like, yeah, that's what I'm after. Because he's the guitar playing person, I am not. So I don't spend my time doing it, I spend my time doing what I'm good at. So make sure that that's the path that you take there. Often the best way to do these things is to hire somebody who can do them. Oh, and the one more thing which is super, super important and super not done. I have saved several records already uh, where people were wanting auto-tuning done. And, yeah, their tuning was not perfect. But when you apply auto-tuning, you take away human emotion. Music's always about humanity. It's always about humanity. Even if your song's about robots. We are the robots. Do, 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 do. Craft work. Uh, it's still a human thing. Because art is made by and listened to humans. So... The problem with auto-tuning is that it stops the human voice from being human and makes it a robot voice, but not a cool robot voice like a vocoder. It just makes it broken. So if at all possible, don't use it at all. Auto-tune, Melodyne, I just broadly call it Mellow-tune. Don't do it. Chances are, and I've, as I said, saved several records this way, using your delays here, which will have modulation on them, therefore moving the tune up and down, it broadens that person's tuning. So if the real tuning was, let's say, here and there here, we go, oh, well, that's easy. We'll just fix it to here and they'll be great. No, they won't. They'll sound broken because they now sound like weird. auto tune weird. And I don't mean T-Pain sound weird. I mean just auto-tune, weird, flat, inhuman. If you bring in an echo, yep, they're still off, but if you modulate that, chances are that modulation covers where they're supposed to be in tune, which means that the, the brain will now sort of normalize that and go, oh yeah, they, they're mostly in tune. We'll accept that far better. They sound good because they sound thicker and richer because of the modulation, the echo and the reverb, 
which probably has modulation in it, as you, as you saw. So we've now spread their actual tuning range from sort of being just a little under to quite broad. And therefore, the human brain will normalize them and quite quickly accept that they're adequately in tune. <laughs> this is this is a great saving because not only do you not need to spend time messing around with mellow tune, you don't have to deal with the fact that you just made them sound terrible and now you're going to try and resolve why they sound so terrible and lifeless and you can't put life back in. You've used the human brain, thank you NVIDIA, to actually solve some of their tuning issue. It's better if you get someone who can sing, sing reasonably in tune in the first place, but they come across and, well, they could be better, but they could be worse, and it's dumb to tune. If you don't need to tune, you can just pull them in using the modulations inside your um, echoes, and that feeds a reverb, and you end up with a broader sense of where their tuning's at, and it'll intersect. If they're anywhere near the note, it'll intersect with the note that ideally they are around. We're never perfectly in tune and that's part of why um, mellow tune always sounds wrong because there's no such thing as a singer who's perfectly in tune or if there is, they're not much fun to listen to. If you have any questions about the process, um, please don't ask me what's the best reverb because I've already answered that one, the one you make yourself. That doesn't mean you have to do what I've done here, but if you've got a reverb device, a VST for reverberation, and this does a nice job, as does the, um, the multiplier, that was one of the, the features that it was designed to do was to provide reverb. There's Go watch the videos, look at the presets, you will find that there are things that indicate how reverb is built in there. Especially put the two together, you will get a really nice sounding reverb if you process it then with maybe a little bit of compression to smush it, um, or a little bit of drive to smush it, saturation um, and EQ to, to create the tone that you want. It's all possible from within here, but that third layer of, of processing you saw really changed that, that reverb built from three echo units. Do this and that way you will understand how it's built using whatever Pro VST that you've got. You're starting to understand this is what's going on underneath the GUI and therefore able to build your own sound. You want a sparser sound? Great! You can build a sparser sound in Pro something or other. If you want a smoother sound, great! You know how to do it either by just adding more taps or, um, or combining this with a, um, a reverb like the um, RV7000 in Reason, which is very smooth, very clean, but never meant to be used entirely on its own. Put that into the pack here, and that way a little bit of that will suddenly go, oh, hello. Then you can start to really control your own things. So you, I've done reviews of, of reverbs, but work on really understanding the how is this put together. If you have questions, ask on down below. If you are asking about a specific mix situation, firstly, well, this is my this is my living, so probably you should be paying, but I don't mind, so long as it's a public discussion in which everybody can learn. That means the rule is you need to do a, like a screen recording, OBS, not phone to screen. Show what you've got ask your question once I become aware of it, then I'll come in if it's appropriate and, and all can benefit, I will give an answer for all, which will help you if you follow the advice, but it'll help everybody. Um, all that's left is to go out there, practice, practice, practice. It takes a long time to get this. Reverb and compression are probably the hardest or most complex things in the, 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 the you know, getting your toolkit set up. Um, not because they're hard, actually because they're too easy for people to comprehend, therefore they overdo it. They think that it must be more complex than it really is. It's all just creating the illusion that you want people to have. Go out there, practice, 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 and make sure that you are having fun.